This is going to be another study on Bible villains, a part of our series on fighting the famine, which is the plans to give you something really good every week that you can mark up your Bible with and feel like you just had a fresh meal out of the Bible. So we're fighting the famine. And the Bible villain this week is Pharaoh. Now, I'm going to give you your three applications for this story. And one of the greatest things you can do when you're reading the Bible is ask yourself, what are the three applications in this story or this verse? Now, historically, what we're going to look at is Israel is in Egypt under the bondage of Pharaoh in the book of Exodus. And they cry out to God, and the Lord raises up a deliverer, which is Moses, to get them out from under Pharaoh. Also remember that there is more than one Pharaoh in the Bible. You see, Pharaoh is a title and not a name. And then practically, I'm going to give you the a breakdown for the first 11 chapters of Exodus and show you how you can apply them to yourself practically. In chapters 1 through 3, it pictures lost people or worldly Christians. Pictured by Israel. Israel pictures lost people or worldly Christians who are living out in the world. Pictured by Egypt under the bondage of sin. Pharaoh and Egypt. And they're afflicted by the devil. Who's pictured by our villain, Pharaoh. So that's how you can look at it. When you're reading about Israel being in bondage to the to Egypt and Pharaoh, you can think, well, that's the way I was before I was saved or after I got saved and just out in the world, you know, under the bondage of the flesh, the world, and the devil. But then in chapters 4 through 6, the deliverer shows up. Moses, a type of Jesus, delivers them just as the Lord delivers us in our afflictions, just as the Lord delivered you when you got saved just as he delivers you in trials and temptations after you get saved. And then in chapter 7 through 11, you have Pharaoh, type of the devil or antichrist, who is our adversary. He would do everything he can to make sure you stay in Egypt. The devil do, will do everything he can to keep you in the world. Pharaoh tried to do everything he could to not let the people go. The devil will do anything he can to keep you from getting saved and then after you get saved, he'll do what he can to make sure you don't do anything with your salvation. And doctrinally, the third application, doctrinally speaking, Pharaoh is a type of the Antichrist. And the plagues that he goes through shows us events that are, will happen in the tribulation. And God is going to reveal who the true hero and savior is by allowing men like Pharaoh to be born and continue living. It even talks about Pharaoh in Romans chapter 9. Romans nine seventeen, For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. <clears throat> so God allows people like him to stay in existence, that he might show his power, show who the true hero is. So now... Buckle up, get your wide margin Bibles, your micron pens, a cup of coffee, whatever, and let's feast on the word for a while. Now, I'm going to give you some similarities between Pharaoh and the devil slash the Antichrist. Number one, Pharaoh is called a dragon. In Ezekiel 29.3, it says, Speak and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of his rivers, which hath said, My river is mine own, and I have made it for myself. You see, Pharaoh is called a dragon. The Antichrist gets his power from the dragon in Revelation 13, 2. It says, And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So there's your first similarity right there. Pharaoh's a dragon. The devil's a dragon. The Antichrist gets his power from the dragon. And the dragon is no match for the Lord Jesus Christ. He is a dragon slayer. In Isaiah 27, 1, it says, in that day. And watch out for that phrase, in that day. When you see that phrase, in that day, it's mostly referring to the second coming of the Lord. And it says, in that day, the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan. 
Remember that name, Leviathan the piercing serpent, even Leviathan that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. If there's any doubt in your mind about who Leviathan is, he's not just a sea creature, but also the devil. If there's any doubt in your mind about who he is, then compare the verse we just read, Isaiah 27, 1, with Revelation 12, 9. Revelation 12, 9 says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So, Isaiah 27, 1 identifies Leviathan as the piercing serpent, the crooked serpent, and the dragon. And then Revelation 12, 9 calls the dragon, that old serpent, the devil, and Satan. So Leviathan, the serpent, the dragon, the devil, and Satan are one and the same. It's the same enemy. It's a great red dragon. Who's going to be killed by the dragon slayer? You see, any movie or book or TV show that depicts a mighty warrior slaying a dragon stole the idea from the Bible. It says in Isaiah 51, 9, Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the ancient days, in the generations of old. Art thou not it that hath cut Rahab and wounded the dragon? And this isn't Pete's friendly dragon, any more than the guys from Genesis 6 are big friendly giants. Uh, this is an evil great red dragon. In Jeremiah 51, 34, it says, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, hath devoured me. He hath crushed me. He hath made me an empty vessel. He hath swallowed me up like a dragon. He has filled his belly with my delicates. He hath cast me out. Nebuchadnezzar, a future Bible villain we'll be talking about in the future, or maybe in a few lessons from now, he's also referred to as a dragon. Isn't that something? You see, evil men are compared to dragons. That makes sense. And when I was young, I watched a lot of martial arts movies, and they always used that name dragon. One of them was Kiss of the Dragon. You find that idea in the Bible. You say, how? Well, Satan entered Judas, right? And then he gave the Lord a Judas kiss. There's your kiss of the dragon. I think there's one called Unleash the Dragon. Something like that. Well, that's what happens after the uh, at the end of the millennium. The dragons unleash from the bottomless pit for a little bit. I think there's one called Enter the Dragon. You know, there's up there, the martial arts movie is always talking about the dragon. And Pharaoh is a great dragon, and the Antichrist gets his power from the dragon. As it says in Revelation 13, 2, he gets his power from the dragon. Now, God can give you power, and the devil can give you power. Where does your power come from? Think about it. Any power that you've got to do what you do, where does that power come from? Are you getting it from the devil, or are you getting it from the Lord? See, back when I used to listen to a lot of rock music as a lost person, the music would give me, I felt like some temporary power, like before I got in a fight or something. You know, a lot of times when those fighters come out of the tunnels, you know, before the fight, they got this wicked music playing. And that music is powerful. Your flesh loves it. It can give you some temporary power, temporarily psyched up. Musicians are powerful on stage. Hollywood is powerful with their special effects. Athletes are powerful with what they do. Where does their power come from? Have they sold themselves to work evil in the sight of the Lord and they're getting power that way? Or are we getting our power from the Lord? Like preachers from days gone by who, you know, they, they get up as they preach in front of a crowd of people and they God gives them the power and then the words, gives them the right words at the right time. You know, I've just... Just teaching Sunday school a lot of times, or even on here, I've I've been given words that I didn't have planned to say. Sometimes I think, well, maybe somebody listening to this needed that. 
and God knew they were going to listen to it. I believe that's God, you allowing God to use his power through you when that happens. But where does your power come from? The Antichrist gets his power from the dragon. You need to get your power from the dragon slayer. Now, the next thing, number two, this Bible villain Pharaoh doesn't know Joseph, just as the Antichrist won't know the Lord. You see, in Exodus, when it starts talking about this Pharaoh here, Exodus 1.8, it says, Now there rose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. You see, the last Pharaoh over Egypt in Genesis made Joseph the second ruler in the kingdom and treated Israel well for Joseph's sake. But this king knew not Joseph. And if you know anything about typology at all, then you know Joseph is the greatest type of Jesus Christ in the Bible. So by saying Pharaoh knew not Joseph, you get the picture of the Antichrist who won't know Jesus. If you look at it and uh, as looking at it as the types. And a prophecy of the Antichrist himself and Daniel says, in Daniel eleven thirty seven, it says, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. He's not going to have any room for Jesus. He's not going to know Jesus in the sense that me and you know him. He's just going to blaspheme him. As it says in Revelation 13, 5 and 6, he's going to open his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell therein. The Antichrist won't know Jesus. If you're saved, then you know Jesus Christ and he knows you. He'll never be able to look at you and say, I never knew you because he does know you. But are you growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? It should be a constant growth <coughs> in how much you know the Lord. Are you growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? When you look at Pharaoh, you're looking at somebody who does not know God. You, when you look at the Antichrist, you're looking at somebody who doesn't know God. Um, when you look at the devil, you're looking at somebody who hung around the throne of God as the anointed cherub and knows God in a way that me and you don't know him, but we know him in the way that you have to know him. You know, the devil may know some things about God that we don't know, obviously. But he doesn't know God in the way that me and you know God. Because we know him as our Savior. And he's not the devil's Savior. He's not the Antichrist's Savior. But you need to be in a constant growth of knowledge after you get saved. Constantly learning something new. You don't want to get to the judgment seat of Christ and not know anything about Jesus Christ other than that he saved you, you know. Now, number three, Pharaoh and the Antichrist both persecute God's people. When Israel was in Egypt, Pharaoh made them work like dogs. In Exodus 1.14, it says, And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. And all their service, wherein they made them serve, was with rigor. You see, Israel was rough and tough and mighty people because of all this persecution and suffering. Do you know what the dragon does? The devil, what he does in the time of Jacob's trouble? He persecutes Israel, just like Pharaoh's doing in Exodus chapter 1. It says in Revelation twelve thirteen, And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. The woman is Israel, and she's being persecuted by the dragon and by the man who's getting his power from the dragon, the Antichrist. And see, persecution, the good thing about it is it just makes you stronger. And Paul even says to Tim Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you're living godly, Stand up for what's right, you will suffer persecution. But the thing is, the persecution just makes you stronger. You know that saying, what doesn't kill you, makes you stronger. And that's somewhat true, if you look at it in the right way. 
Because the more persecution you you go through, the stronger you're going to be. The more rewards you're going to get if you take it in the way you should. In 1 Peter 4, 12 through 14, it says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fire, fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be approached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. You see, you need to be going through the sufferings for Christ and the persecutions happily, joyfully, and glorying in infirmities and in tribulations and afflictions. Because it's going to make you stronger and you're going to get rewarded for it. So they both persecuted God's people. The next thing, this thing of killing babies. You see, Pharaoh killed babies. Herod killed babies. Most likely, the Antichrist is going to kill babies. I'm just speculating that the Antichrist is going to be very pro-abortion. I'm guessing he will believe in afterbirth abortion because the pattern is in the Bible. And right off the top of my head, I know two types of Antichrist that want to kill babies, Pharaoh and Herod. Also consider the fact that evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. So if they were doing it, what do you think the Antichrist is going to do? Also consider how in the tribulation that because iniquity shall abound, the love of me shall wax cold. You think he's going to have a just this new found love for babies? No. In Exodus one fifteen through 16, it says, And the king of Egypt, which is Pharaoh, spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Shifra, and the name of the other was Pua, and he said, When you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him, but if it be a daughter, then she shall live. So, he wants to kill all the male children. If, if they be born a male, he wants them dead. And the devil's desire is to kill the man-child. In Revelation 12, 3 and 4, it says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. Now watch this. And the dragon, and remember Pharaoh is also called a dragon, and the dragon stood before the woman, Israel, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born, just like Pharaoh. So you see the similarities are there. Pharaoh, back there in Exodus one sixteen, he says, you know, if it be, uh, it says, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him. He wants to kill all the male children. And see, this shows something good about Pharaoh, though. He's got it more sense than a lot of people got today because he could identify a son from a daughter. And you're like, okay, well, think about it today. You know, this lady just said, I don't know how to identify between a man and a woman. I'm not a biologist. What kind of world are we living in when somebody who's supposed to be smart says that they can't tell the difference between a man and a woman because she's not a biologist? You know, when I was a kid, to figure out if a dog was a boy or a girl, what did you do? I mean, I wasn't a biologist. I'm still not. I don't know too much, but I know that much. You know, I, Pharaoh wasn't a biologist, but he uh, he could tell if it was a boy or a girl. But like I said, Pharaoh was a wicked man. But remember, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. Now, these people today that have these ideas may not be wicked in the sense that Pharaoh was wicked. But you get uh, an extremely wicked person who's got these same kind of kooky, crazy ideas of saying, I don't know if it's a man or a woman, uh, that's got the mindset of you're supposed to, you, you can't help who you love. When you, get, when you finally get this extremely wicked man, the Antichrist, who's also going to have these same crazy, kooky ideas 
that these people have are having right now, that's going to be an extremely wicked man who's going to do a lot of damage. A lot of damage. Not only is he going to have the power to do it, but he's going to have the same crazy mindset to make this world just upside down. But like I said, Herod, another type of the Antichrist, also wants to kill the males to and under. The devil wants to devour the man child as Pharaoh wants to devour the male children in Exodus. So you can see the similarities. It's uncanny. It can't be a coincidence. Now the next thing, number five, both have henchmen who perform miracles. You see, God's men were Moses and Aaron in Exodus. Pharaoh's men were at least two of these magicians. There was more than that, but at least two of these main ones. And we speculate that they are named Janes and Jambres because it says in 2 Timothy 3, 8, Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so did these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. So these two magicians do a good portion. They're able to do a good portion of the things that Moses and Aaron were doing. But they were still pale in comparison. And they couldn't perform all the miracles either. But the devil gives them power to perform miracles. Just as he gives the Antichrist and the false prophet power to perform miracles in the tribulation. You see, the Antichrist is going to have uh, one of his henchmen is going to be the false prophet. I'm sure they'll have many more. But both Pharaoh and the Antichrist are going to have men under them with power. It says in Exodus 7, 9 through 13, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you. Notice that miracle. Uh, the Old Testament was full of miracles because it's God dealing with Israel and the Jews require a sign. In the tribulation, it's going to be full of crazy things, crazy signs and miracles because it's God dealing with Israel. And in the tribulation, he's going back to dealing with Israel. It says, show a miracle for you. Then thou shalt say unto Aaron, take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh and it shall become a serpent. There's the sign. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Now here's his henchmen coming in. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. So you see, they, they were able to do the same thing, but they still paled in comparison. God's men always won. But what this shows us is Pharaoh and the devil, they had men who could counterfeit these miracles, probably deceive a lot of people. The Antichrist has the false prophet who will perform miracles. Look at Revelation 13, 11 through 14. It says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exerciseth all of the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to to the beast. So the false prophet, he's going to be able to have these these powers. The Antichrist will have these powers. He's going to deceive people with all signs and lying wonders. I mean, there's going to be a strong delusion because you've got these men who are able to do the type of stuff that Elijah was doing. But there's going to be things about them that's going to raise up red flags. And the people are going to have to be able to identify that. Remember that we, and today especially, me and you, we're not looking for miracles. We're not looking for signs and wonders. As <coughs> born-again believers in the church age, we don't require a sign. It's the Jews who require a sign, according to 1 Corinthians one twenty two. So don't trust in miracles. Don't trust in experiences. Don't trust in your feelings and your emotions. Don't be led by your emotions and say, well, I just feel this way or I know what I felt or I had this experience. You always have to go back to the Bible 
and Peter himself who had all types of experiences and seen all types of signs and wonders. I mean, he was given the signs of the apostle himself. His shadow passing over somebody could heal them. But you know what he said in Second Peter 1.19? He says, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Peter believed that the Bible itself was more proof and a more sure thing than any of the signs and wonders that he ever even saw. Even more than seeing Jesus Christ right in front of him. The next thing, number six, both Pharaoh and the Antichrist will suffer plagues by the hand of Moses. If you studied Revelation chapter 11, then most likely you have come to the conclusion that the two witnesses are Moses and Elijah. And remember that Pharaoh suffers plagues at the hand of Moses and Aaron. Also remember that the Antichrist himself will be pestered by Moses during the tribulation. The plagues in Exodus match the catastrophes in the book of Revelation. It also makes you wonder if the Lord will partly use Moses again to bring these same plagues all over again. History repeating itself. You see, back in Exodus, what would you have? You had the water turned to blood. In Exodus 7, 19 through 22, what happened? The water was turned to blood. So Moses turned the water to blood back then. But remember what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 1, 9? The thing that hath been is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. There's no new thing under the sun. You see, it happened back then in history. But it also represents something that's going to take place prophetically. In Revelation 16, 3 through 4, it says, And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of water, and they became blood. So once again, the waters are turned to blood. It happened back in Exodus. It's going to happen again in the book of Revelation. What else? Moses also brought the plague of frogs in Exodus 8, 1 through 6. And this reminds us of how <clears throat> unclean spirits jump out of the mouths of the unholy trinity during the tribulation time period. They uh, probably spread like the frogs did in the book of Exodus. So Moses brought those plague of frogs, right? Well, look, well, look what happens in Revelation 16, 13, 14. It says, And I, thought, I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth into the kings of the earth and the, of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So, these frogs represent these unclean spirits. It's going to be a time of spiritual wickedness on this earth like you've never seen. It's going to be a plague of evil spirits. And then also, back in Exodus, what you have? You had the plague of lice. This was the one plague that the magicians couldn't counterfeit back in Exodus eight sixteen through 17. And most likely this same plague will happen again in the tribulation because the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, are said to be able to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Most likely they're going to do the same plagues that Moses did back in Exodus. And it says they're going to be able to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will in Revelation eleven six. And this would probably also go for the moraine, the disease of cattle that happened in Exodus 9-3 to Pharaoh in Egypt. And it doesn't stop there. You remember uh, the plague of boils that Moses and Aaron brought to Pharaoh and Egypt in Exodus 9-8-12. Well, check out what happens to those who take the mark of the beast in Revelation 16-2. It says, And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. So they got a sore on them for worshipping the Antichrist, just as that plague of boils came on Pharaoh in Egypt. Another one, the plague of hell in Exodus nine twenty three through 24. Once again, 
it's going to happen again. It says in Exodus 9, 24, so there was hell and fire mingled with the hell. Hell and fire mingled with the hell. Very grievous, it says. Then look what it says in Revelation 8, 7. The first angel sounded, and there followed hell and fire mingled with blood. So you got hell and fire, and this time it's mingled with blood too. And then you got the plague of locusts. Remember, Moses and Aaron bringing the plague of locusts in Exodus 10, 4 through 5, all over Pharaoh and Egypt. Then what happens in Revelation chapter 9, 1 through 6? The locusts come up out of the bottomless pit, and they torment men for five months. Just as those locusts tormented uh, back in the book of Exodus. And then it doesn't end there. What about the darkness? It says in Exodus 10, 21 through 23, And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land, the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. So Moses brought darkness over Pharaoh's kingdom. In Revelation 16.10, the Lord brings darkness over the Antichrist kingdom. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. So just as he brought darkness over Pharaoh's kingdom, he's going to bring darkness over the Antichrist kingdom. So you see, you can't, <clears throat> you can't just tell me that this is just history. It's not just history that you're reading about in Exodus with Pharaoh. It's prophecy of something that's not even taken place yet. But now the seventh thing, both Pharaoh and the devil use many waters as a way to trap God's people. As you probably know, the children of Israel, you know, after Pharaoh eventually let them go, they had to cross the Red Sea to get away from Pharaoh and his army because they just came after him again. That's how hard Pharaoh's heart was. And he thought he was going to have them trapped. Because it says in Exodus 14.3, For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land. The wilderness hath shut them in. So he thinks they're going to be trapped there and he can just come and take them right back. But then what happens in Exodus 14, 15 through 16, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore Christ thou unto me, speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. But lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. So you know what happens? They cross the Red Sea on dry ground. But what did Pharaoh think? He thought that that, the, that many waters was going to keep them in, entangled and not be able to go any further. But God intervened. But look what the serpent does to Israel in the tribulation. And it's similar to look what took place with Pharaoh, the great dragon. At Revelation twelve fifteen, it says, And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. So just as Pharaoh thought he could trap God's people with those many waters, the devil thought he could use many waters to carry away God's people. But God intervenes both times. The similarities are just too many to count. Number eight, Pharaoh and the Antichrist get a baptism by the Lord. And probably not the baptism you're thinking of. But they get. But what happens is they both get fully immersed by the Lord himself. One in the Red Sea and both of them in the Lake of Fire. In Exodus 15.3, it says, The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. And that is exactly how he will be at the second coming when he comes back to take over and slay the Antichrist. But it's awesome to me that it says this back when Pharaoh was killed. In Exodus 15.4, it says, Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. So, the same way that Pharaoh gets baptized in, the, in that Red Sea, fully immersed, 
is the same way the Antichrist is going to meet a similar fate when the Lord comes back as a man of war once again in Revelation 19, 19 through 20. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse. There's that man of war and against his army. And the beast, which is the Antichrist, was taken with him, the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. You see, Pharaoh will go to that lake of fire eventually. He's so wicked that he gets comfort over damning up people with him. It's like the devil. But just the same way that Pharaoh got fully immersed in that Red Sea, the Antichrist gets a baptism of fire in the lake of fire and eventually Pharaoh's going to go to that lake of fire and be there with the Antichrist and the false prophet eventually. And, but the thing is, Pharaoh gets comfort over seeing people that he damned. And it says in Ezekiel thirty-two thirty-one, Pharaoh shall see them and shall be comforted over all his multitude. Even Pharaoh and all his army slain by the sword, said the Lord God. The only comfort in hell will be the comfort that the devil and the Antichrist and wicked men have by knowing that they don't have to be there alone, that they damn some other people to go with them. But that is Bible villain number three, Pharaoh. And he is definitely a Bible villain. But I hope this has gave you a good feast on the word. If you've been following along and taking notes, we've went over a tremendous amount of verses and I hope you've feasted on the Word of God.